On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family through their Facebook page, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios. What's up, Lance? Uh, not too much. How are you today? Doing great here on this morning in Wormtown. And uh, we're talking today about a few different things. Yeah, so my answer of like not much is up is sort of a lie. It's just a polite thing to do, I guess. Um, no, there's a lot up. There's uh, results on the soil testing that we, uh, the soil samples that we delivered to the UMass uh, Soil and Plant Nutrient Testing Laboratory. We spoke to a woman at this soil lab, lovely woman named Tracy, and she said that this is pretty typical of a wooded area in New England. Yes, it's typical New England soil that hasn't been disturbed in quite a while, meaning it hasn't been uh, like cultivated. She said there hasn't been any sort of lime treatment there. Or fertilized. Or fertilized, right. So it hasn't been anything where someone has uh, taken a, uh, you know, like a, 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 a soil, uh, what do you call it, those... Till. Yeah, till. They are, or there, there wasn't a garden made, is what I'm trying to right, say. There's, right, There was no sort of... Um, attempt to grow anything on this on this area which i guess we we knew that just because of the history there and you know, there was a trailer park there at one time yeah she basically said it was comparable to soil you would find in the woods anywhere in new england yeah there was some um organic matter which got progressively smaller in percentage as you got further down so she said that was suggestive of maybe uh, leaves or uh, needles, like pine needles that had been there a while and had um, gone into the soil. Right. So it, she said it's very typical for it to be at a 3% uh, organic matter percentage and then you know, routinely go down the deeper you go. Yep, she used the word typical a few times and she even used the word unremarkable at one point. So, uh, so what we've got from these soil results is, you know, nothing definitive. Questions? Yeah, there was nothing that came up where she said this is unusual. Right. So uh, we do have, it really doesn't tell us much about why there is an anomaly underneath there. I right. mean, you could, we've, we've seen that with our own eyes. I think the implication, though, that the organic matter would have been higher, the percentage would have been higher if, if say, a body was there for Absolutely, any amount of time, yeah. I think, um, you know, in, in the dirt anyway. So we know that there, that situation wasn't there, that there was a body in the dirt. She did say that it hasn't been disturbed in quite a while. So I don't know what quite a while is, and I don't think she has a definition for quite a while. Could not being disturbed for 10 years lead to these results? Probably. If you have if you have soil that has been disturbed at one point and then rests for, for a dozen years, maybe, maybe you get these results as well. From what she said, you know, you could probably say that that's the case, that you could disturb soil and then put it back in and you can get these results. What definitely was not done, though, was any sort of fertilization. Right. So where does that leave us then with this lawn? Of course, we're talking about Rick's old lawn, which is about 100 or 200 yards from Mora's crash site. And uh, he is uh, a person that some suspect uh, of wrongdoing in this case. And so that's why we're looking at that property. 
I think where this leads us now is to utilize our GoFundMe account again and get uh, Ed and Graham back up there from uh, GB Geotechnics. And we can actually dig now because we know we're not going to be disturbing any sort of uh, organic matter. We know that there's not going to be any sort of disturbance there in relation to an investigation for anything that was decomposing underneath. So I, as, as much as it sounds like a disappointment that there was no organic matter there, there's still something there that, that is creating an anomaly or was something there that's creating an anomaly. So I think we can dig there with a little bit more confidence that we're not disrupting any sort of organic material. I think so. And we can actually try to find out what that anomaly in the lawn is or yep. was. And we have full access to it. The current owners have given us full access and have agreed to allow us to dig at some point. Yes, very exciting. So we are going to do that, at least find out what this anomaly in the lawn right under where Rick's old trailer was, is, or was. And so we'll take it that far. And speaking of the current owners of that house, we do have a brief little chat with them. Yeah, from our trip, we went up there last month to do a little housekeeping, you know, show our face again, get a, uh, a couple of uh, recon missions out of the way, and flew up there under the radar and spoke to them, and they, they graciously once again agreed to cooperate with us, and they had no problem being recorded. Okay, so here is what the current owners have to say about when the state police searched their property back in 2009. The, the first night we were living in the house, um, two state police detectives showed up at our door and they introduced themselves and they said that they had never had a chance to um, inspect this property and they wanted to do it. And they said they wanted to do bring some cadaver dogs and uh, just kind of like run over the place because they didn't believe that Mora was here, but they wanted to rule it out as an option. And then... Uh, month and a half later, they came to do the investigation. They brought uh, two cadaver dogs um, and some fiber optic camera stuff. And they um, went up to the third floor of our house and uh, ran a fiber optic cable up through there, uh, our fiber optic camera up through there to see if there was anything in that crawl space. Uh, and uh, they didn't say anything that they found. And they also did it um, to check a look at uh, behind our, our bathtub as well. And uh, and then they went through the entire property with the cadaver dogs. Yeah. Checked all the outbuildings and stuff like that, too. Yep. The construction of the bathroom is a little peculiar because there's a, a shower um, stall that's put in front of a window. So when you look at the house from the outside, you see a window. But when you're in the bathroom, you don't see the window because the shower itself is it's been put in front of it. So I think that was just something they wanted to rule out. They just took a peek back there with their fiber optic camera and, and made sure that nothing was there. They said that they don't believe she is here after that investigation. We're very supportive of the Murray family, and we ca I can't even imagine what it must be like to be missing a child. Um, and we're totally open to working with them, you know, to try and find their daughter. But we also have to remember that, you know, this is a, a small community. People like their privacy, and it's important that we respect that. It's a pretty interesting stuff there, Lance. I know that the community has kind of talked about this for a long time, and, you know, what what happened and and there was kind of some rumors about uh the state police having checked the place out but we finally get to hear it from the horse's mouth so to speak yeah i think it's uh, a couple of points that are particularly interesting with this is that they and we can't say state, state this enough they were there that night they were there that night to talk to them to search and then they came back later on at a later date with cadaver dogs and searched the entire property um one thing that stood out is that they said they didn't believe she was there but wanted to rule it out. So that's really interesting that they they did this to rule it out, that there was no belief that she was there, at least based on what they said. Right. But that doesn't mean that they aren't still following up on Rick as a person. Um, just means that their intelligence led them to believe that Mora wasn't on that property. They wanted to rule it out. Yeah, yeah the property. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the property, but not specifically we don't know if they wanted to rule out rick right right it's it's just it's an interesting choice of words i don't know if that was exactly verbatim what they said like hey we don't believe she's here maybe it was just something that they tell them so they don't get nervous about their you know possibly being a body on their property sure 
I did find it interesting that after saying that, they go through the effort of placing fiber optic cameras into little crawl spaces and into uh, behind the bathroom, behind the bathtub, because there's that that odd uh, window there that is blocked by the by the bathtub and shower. Yeah, and and the police peeked up into the crawl space in the attic. Quick plug. Thank you. But also these lovely people, they went on to sort of have some questions about the floor in their in their house. Here's something that, yeah, should be brought up, I guess, right? Their floor, is the house is built on, there's no basement there. Right. So we'll say there's no basement there. The house is built on a concrete slab, a big, thick concrete slab. And there's no basement, so you got your, your concrete, and then the house is on top of it. And one of the things we had talked about doing was doing GPR, uh, ground penetrating radar, on the bottom floor of their house to see if there's any kind of cavities or anything bizarre going on under there. And when we arrived at, at the place and when we got there, when we did all this, we decided not to do it because we had heard that the foundation had already been poured by the time Mora went missing. Right. It, the foundation was already there in some form. And when you're inside the house, the, the floor that they have in their living room and in their kitchen is covered by you know, these uh, like linoleum flooring. And the way it's put together, it's almost like one giant piece. So if there were anything there, you know, we're weighing our options and we were thinking if there was something there, what are we going to really pull up their, their floor? Like that would destroy their floor. Right. And that is the, the expense to fix that would be astronomical. Right. So however, fast fast forward to our, our meeting with them last month, and they discovered something strange when when one of them dropped something on the floor and went to pick it up. And they both sort of looked at each other and said, that sounds like it's hollow. Yeah. So they they were just kind of more curious. And again, I think with this lovely couple, they don't believe more is there or anything like that. It's just you just want to be 100 percent sure. And when we have Graham and Ed coming back up there, uh, you know, in the near future to uh, to do some more work. Might as well just have them swing in there with the quick handheld GPR and uh, and run it over a few areas. See, you know, just to set everyone's mind at ease. Right. To rule things out, we need to do the same thing that we just heard them say that the police did. They needed to go in and rule out certain uh, factors. Again, that being said, I find it very interesting that they would even bring that up to us. It definitely left something with them. It resonated with them when they heard that the, the this area of the floor sounded hollow compared to other areas of the floor. And they know the result of the GPR and there was something there. They know what the result of that's going to be. They have to, they have to consider pulling their floor up. Right. But it's still such a long shot because cadaver dogs have been through there and everything and w- which may happen again soon. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen at all, to be honest. Hopefully, <laughs> unless, unless we're certain that there's something really interesting there. Right. I mean, there, there, there could be other ways around it. You know, if there's a, if there's some sort of cavity in there, and instead of pulling up the entire floor, maybe you can drill in the side because there's a, the, the side is visible. Maybe you can drill in the side and send a fiber optic camera in. Uh, we did something similar at the A-frame house, but I mean, you're talking about drilling through feet of concrete. Yeah, it takes some serious uh, machinery. Lance, did you know that Blue Apron delivers farm-fresh ingredients and step-by-step recipes to your door? I did know that, and I did also know that Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, even you. They do, too. And they do. You can cook incredible meals in as little as 20 minutes. Blue Apron delivers fresh, seasonally-inspired ingredients. So let Blue Apron do the meal prep for you, make back-to-school easier than ever. Dinner in as little as 20 minutes. And we both know the wide range of recipes that just burst with flavor from Blue Apron. Whether you're looking for quick and easy meals or a full culinary cooking experience, Blue Apron lets you choose from a range of recipe options. And very exciting. They have chef design recipes and exciting September partnerships like Bob's Burgers inspired uh. 
burgers and the whole 30 approved dinners. So check out the crispy chicken tenders and mashed potato. Just sounds delicious this month, Lance. I saw your eyes light up when you saw that recipe. Ah, Your mouth was watering. It looks delicious. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free at blueapron.com slash missing. That's blueapron.com slash missing to get your first three meals for free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Okay, so speaking of the other property of interest that we had checked out a couple months ago when we did uh, our ground-penetrating radar search with GB Geotechnics, the A-Frame property, the A-Frame house. Recently, we spoke to Chuck West of the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit, and he gave us some information about the A-Frame property testing. And before this call actually took place, though, we got an email from from Chuck and he said, uh, you know, can you guys or one of you guys hop on a call real quick? And then we talked real quick and we were nervous. We're like, what do we do? What do we do? Because it's not every day that Chuck West or anybody in that position sends you an email and says, hey, we need to get on the phone and chat. You know, do you guys have time to talk on the phone? And, you know, we were speculating about, you know, did we did we screw something up? Like that's instantly where our heads went. (laughs) You know, what did we screw up? What did we mess up? Guilty conscience or something or just like uh, coming from a background of of not expecting uh, any good news. Right. Oh, like coming from a background (laughs) of the other shoe always drops. (laughs) Right. and, and, And typically getting an email from somebody like Chuck West is saying, call me isn't really. Like, doesn't really uh, give you a sense of uh, <laughs> of everything's normal and you're doing okay, right? But uh, but he is a, gr- a great guy, and uh, we did speak to him, and he was not mad at us, and was not uh, calling to reprimand us or uh, talk to us about anything that we did um, negatively. He was giving us results for the paneling in the A frame closet, right? As he said he would when we collected everything that day, he took uh, several. Uh, panel pieces with him we we bagged them and did it right in front of him and he took several bags with him and he told us that he was adapting to the times and he felt like due to the work that we had put into all of this with maggie and with art and with the family and with uh, the owners of the a-frame that we deserved to know the results when it came back. He said, I, I feel like, you know, there's no reason why I wouldn't tell you this at this point. He said, the wood chips have no evidentiary value to this case or any other case. Which is which is fantastic. Whether it's blood or not, we still don't have an answer from the police about that, but we do know that it's not more as blood. And we do know that there was no case that was open from that house that this is connected to. As far as we know. Right. That was one of our concerns was that it would come back and it would be blood from something that was, you know, not identifiable or a human that was not identifiable. And then it would lead us down another rabbit hole of, well, whose blood is this and why is there so much of it when, you know, we've heard that the luminol lights it up like a Christmas tree. But as it turns out, according to Chuck West and his department, there is no evidentiary value at all based on Moore's case or any other case. That's what he said. Yeah. Now, we could still test our wall paneling and try to find out whose blood that is. That may be a long process, may involve uploading it to DNA websites. But at least from the state police, you know, we know it's not Morris. So is there any reason to do that? I don't know. Yeah, they, the cadaver dog issue with the cadaver dogs going in there. If, uh, if this wasn't the A-frame house and this wasn't involved with Morris' disappearance in some way, you could bring cadaver dogs into probably any house in the country and cadaver dogs would, I'd say there's a, I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, I'd well, say there's a, die, people saying. die yeah. in homes. Yeah. And sometimes they stay in homes after they've died because of, you know, multiple circumstances. Mm -hmm. But to have a cadaver dog go off in this house and then have blood stains, you're putting it together. We put it together and we're saying, well, this sort of makes sense when you look at the history of the previous, I guess, pseudo owners. Yeah. And I mean, and normally when someone dies of old age in a house, you know, they just get shoved right into a closet under the stairs. 
Yeah, if you just like push them in there, you, well, you don't want to deal with it. <laughs> just, just kidding. Obviously, like the the question is still here about what what that is. Um, so I mean, I I would love to put it out there to the audience and and ask for some emails to uh, to hear what you guys think. Should we investigate this further and find out whose blood? I mean, again, this is probably a, a several several month process and not a cheap thing to do. So it it would probably take using some of that GoFundMe money to do this. To find out what uh, what person, you know, or persons are, are have left blood in that closet. In addition to that, we also know that we can test the age of the concrete slab out front. I want to put that out to the to the general public. Is that something we should do? That process is very expensive. That can go upwards over fifteen hundred dollars per sample to get it tested within five years of uh, of a date. So if you test that concrete slab and it it's you know less than ten years old, then you you move on to the next stage, which is do you now start like breaking it apart and digging up what's underneath it because it was poured after the disappearance. So right. But that that is something that is really expensive as well as probably testing DNA and. We know that that's super expensive. So I guess that brings us back to the GoFundMe money and in the GoFundMe account and what to spend that money on. We we got our ground penetrating radar donated pro bono by the wonderful GB Geotechnics out of New York. So we can give them a big thanks for not charging us. But we did obviously pay for uh, lodging and food that, that weekend. So there's a little bit gone. Yeah, there's expenses that have to be taken care of. We needed to get, you know, the the equipment to dig up the little concrete pad in front of Rick's, uh, Rick's old uh, porch there. Yeah. So there's expenses that go into everything here. There's also been like smaller trips that have, uh, you know, small expenses here and there going up there. And testing the soil. Testing the soil. But I guess the question that we're asking the audience is how else to spend that money? Should we run this closet thing down? Should we run this concrete uh, slab thing down if we can on the, on the A-frame property? We, we looked into um, having a billboard put up and uh, we found out, uh, thanks to uh, some, some citizen detectives, uh, that that is very expensive to do. Maybe more expensive than we even imagined. Definitely more expensive than I imagined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then we also heard from Chuck West of the state police cold case unit who said that rewards aren't always valuable because we asked him his opinion on, how, on what to do. And and this was a couple months ago. And he kind of shrugged. He's like, I don't really know. Um, you know, rewards are kind of a double edged sword. He said that that is the reason, at least from his perspective, he said that is the reason why Lawrence Moulton, Claude Moulton's brother, brought the rusty knife to Fred Murray. And said, I think my brother might be involved in this. Chuck said he was trying to get the reward. And what was the reward up to at that point? Was that the $70,000 reward? I am not sure. Either way, it was a lot more than what we've raised so far with the GoFundMe account. Right. So it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if you have a reasonable reward. Would that be better than having a, a ridiculous reward? Because people get greedy and then you just like you get everybody coming out of the woodwork. Or yeah. What would move the needle? What would move the needle without moving it too far? Right. Yeah. So we're not really sure on that. Definitely asking for your opinion on how to spend this money. Please yeah. email us at missingmoramurray at gmail.com, and we will read a lot of these emails in an upcoming episode when we're kind of around having a roundtable discussion about this. Do know, though, that we are planning on taking some cadaver dogs up there, some search cadaver dogs in the near future. Uh, we have yet to put a price tag on that. So we have heard people's uh, thoughts and opinions on whether or not we should do the cadaver dog search. We knew we know that they've been up there before, but it might be such a low cost that you, we should take care of it anyway. We have a couple of new spots that have come to light that we want to run cadaver dogs through. So uh, once we have a price tag on that, We'll, we'll make sure that that makes sense. Yeah, so that is something that is definitely happening in the near future. But beyond those things, um, yeah, really just want to hear from you about this. Email us at missingmoramurray at gmail.com. Now, Lance, I know you know that Simple Contacts is the most convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription and reorder your brand of contacts from anywhere in minutes. 
Tim, this is vision care for the 21st century. Right, but I don't know that because I have perfect vision and I don't need contacts or eyeglasses. Don't you have better than perfect vision? It's true, I do. I really do. Thanks for remembering that. Yeah. Uh, You have better than perfect memory. Yes, exactly. My memory is 1520. So can you please tell me how Simple Contacts works? Yeah, absolutely. If you need to renew your prescription, you take the uh, five-minute Simple Contacts vision test right online. It's reviewed by a licensed doctor, you receive a renewed prescription, and you can reorder your contacts. All you need is your current contacts, an internet connection, and 10 feet of space. Even if you're totally out of contacts, they've got an option for you for that as well. And so it happened really fast, too. Simple contacts vision test is, they say it takes only five minutes. Is that true? And it's reliable. It's designed by doctors and licensed ophthalmologists. They review every test carefully to make sure your eyes look healthy and that your vision hasn't changed. And Simple Contacts has been rated five stars over 4,500 times on the App Store. You can text with the support team and always get to speak with a person. No automated robot systems here. And Tim, it saves you money. This is the best part. Saves you money. The vision test is only $20. Compare that with an appointment. Without insurance, that that could be up to like $200. I should do the test just to find out if I have better than perfect vision or not. The contact lens prices are unbeatable. Standard shipping is free. And best of all, we have a promo for our listeners. Yes. So get $20 off your first order of contacts at simplecontacts.com slash MMM or enter the code MMM at checkout. One more time, that's $20 off your first order of contacts at simplecontacts, all one word, dot com, slash MMM, or enter the code MMM at checkout. And also, please know this is not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. The only test that your current prescription still helps you see 2020 and renews that prescription. They don't write completely new prescriptions or examine eye health. And the last bit of info we just want to talk about here today is our documentary, Lance, Finding Maura Murray. Okay, good segue from raising money, uh, the GoFundMe account, uh, to the documentary. We will be having that on Amazon Video On Demand. There'll be a price tag attached to it. A percentage of that will be going towards the GoFundMe account. So the more downloads we have, the more money goes into that account. And who knows, maybe we can actually afford that billboard. Right. And so we are looking at the middle of September for the first four episodes of this to air and uh, and it'll be on Amazon. And each episode is roughly around a half an hour. And the first four episodes is a deep dive into our trip with James Renner to Canada. That's the first uh, boots on the ground experience we had with the people that were very, very involved in the case, the people that were borderline obsessed with the case. And James was the, I guess, the leading voice at the time with with all the information that he had. And it is a, uh, it is a detailing of our three days in Canada with James Renner. Then we move on to more people in, in, in future episodes. Right. It, it's great. Uh, so, and if you were at the crime con screening or at the Rockwell screening in Somerville, where we showed some of this documentary, there is plenty of additional stuff that we actually unearthed. Um, and uh, by unearthed, I mean, we just hadn't seen in years. Um, and we actually threw some through about five minutes into, uh, one of the episodes, uh, just yesterday. So it, it's really interesting and coming together, uh, in, in a really great way. We're really excited to share it. Um, We don't really have an exact date yet, but you will be hearing more when we do. And if you are one of those people that are, you know, you're involved in this case and you watch this, there's a chance that you might see something of yourself in either James, you, myself, our camera guy, Josh. It, it's very unique in that way where we have almost every level of, of obsession with Moore's disappearance there. James, me, you, Josh, who comes in completely blind to the whole thing yeah and interesting and when you when you put it out there to the mass public like that i think it appeals to all sorts of people people watching these guys and saying what are they doing to people saying well they should be looking here and here and here like those people that are very involved in the case right and episode five will include some other uh people web sleuths uh citizen detectives that uh that you met from the early days yeah this is back in 2014 you met a few people 
and uh, checked out an abandoned house near the crash site. And we also visited Lori Bruno back then uh, for the very first time, which is now, uh, you know, kind of famously one of our original episodes. Yeah, the, that, again, gonna it, it's going to appeal to a wide spectrum of viewers to see a, a young couple who just started reading about Morris case and then got involved to the point where they had gone up there a couple of times and then we hook up with them and the next thing they know we're walking into this dilapidated house and having no clue what we're walking into and we have a camera going it's very it's really fascinating stuff it's a really fascinating exploration into people's psyche when it comes to this and the exciting part is that we're uh, we're starting editing on this this week. So so segment five is uh, underway, uh, and and this is very exciting. These segments are going to roll out on Amazon on this Amazon page, and they will be uploaded when they're complete after the first four. Yeah, we don't have a distributor for this. It's just uh, you know crawlspace media, I guess. So. What that does is it keeps all the creative control for us. It gives us a better opportunity to provide a bigger contribution to the GoFundMe account, but it also <laughs> leaves us with not a schedule. So we don't have a, a contract with a distributor saying we need to release these episodes on these days yeah. uh, at this point. So so bear with us. Bear with us. <laughs> you, you've been along this far uh, for the ride, so uh, just a little longer, and, uh, and this documentary is finally going to be seen. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening to Missing Maura Murray. Follow us on Twitter at Maura Murray Doc. We're also on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube as Missing Maura Murray. And I want to contribute one final thing. It's something that we keep talking about. We heard the owners of uh, Four Sears Home say it. Uh, we've had other people say it. This is a community up there that is a quiet community. People have moved there because they like the solitude. They didn't ask for this to happen. Um, if you are curious about Forcier's House or the A-Frame, just know that there are cameras there and they're very aware of people in that area simply going up there to um, talk about Mora. If you do go up there, just be respectful. Don't go knocking on doors and don't go thinking that people are going to give you answers if you're banging on their door and borderline trespassing. Just have, have a little respect for the people up there. <laughs>